Okay, hi. Uh, I'm to here today with Katie Bracco, and I'm going to ask her to start off by just introducing herself and telling us a, a little bit about um, her position and her attitude towards online teaching. Over to yes, you, Katie. Hi. Thanks, Christy. Um, so I'm Associate Professor of English at University of California, Merced, where I'm also Chair of the Department of Literatures, Languages and Cultures. So um, like most of us, I went to online only in March um, for the two classes I was teaching, a seminar and a larger lecture class. Um, and then I spent a lot of the summer really working with my colleagues on figuring out um, how to put together some best practices and principles for teaching in the fall. And then this fall, I've been teaching, again, a large lecture class and a smaller seminar um, online. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've found, I guess to my surprise, that there are some things about online teaching that have been really great. Um, I obviously, I think obviously, um, really long to see my students in person again and to, to do a lot of those in-person things too. But I do also think that there's some things that I've learned from this experience and that my students have too that will bring back to the physical classroom with us once this is over. Great. So you've almost covered almost my questions already, but I'm going to start and break that down just a little bit. So um, you were saying that the had you done any ex had any experience at all before the pandemic in terms of online teaching? Not really. I mean, I did, you know, I did use sort of the course software, the kind of Canvas supported um, software beforehand. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would have students watch videos on their own time and things like that. So there were some things that um, some people had to learn quite quickly that I was already doing, but I certainly had never held classes on Zoom or, um, or anything like that before this hit. Well, and I guess that's the other question I have, and I'm, I'm really quite interested in um, making a distinction between um, teaching with digital resources and teaching online, because I think a lot of people sort of think of them as the same thing. Um, did you use a lot of digital resources before you actually started teaching online? I would say I used some, maybe not necessarily a lot, but increasingly over the last few years, um, in addition, or sometimes instead of having my students read things, I would have them listen to, you know, a Shakespeare Unlimited podcast, um, or, um, you know, you're able to upload videos in, um, in Canvas. And so I would have them, you know, watch a film um, as their assignment, and then we would talk about it when we got together. So I had been doing things like that, um, and certainly having them use the library's digital resources and things like that. And what did you say that, you, sorry, your um, online, um, uh, well, we had a BLE called Moodle. What do you use? Canvas. Canvas. Okay, that's not one I'm really familiar with, but um, is, and are the, the students happy with that and as a, a means of sort of communication as well as a kind of what we used to call a handbook for the classes? Is that, it, does it encapsulate everything that you do on there? Um, it's okay. I think it's fine. Um, okay, figure it out. Yeah, it's what a lot of American universities use. Um, you know, it allows you to upload files and links and readings, and then it's where they turn in their assignments. And so, you know, it, it puts everything in the same place. It's not it's not always entirely intuitive, but I think once you get used to it, it's it's about as good as those things can be. It's sort of one stop shop. Everything's all in the same place. Okay. Yeah, um, one of the takeaways um, with that software, and I think maybe with others too, is um, grouping things together. So in Canvas, it's called modules, but you can kind of week by week say, okay, so this week you're gonna read this in your textbook. You're gonna click on this link and read this. You're gonna click on this link and watch this video. And then you're gonna click on this link and take this quiz, um, right? Or click on this link and here's where you turn in your paper. And so you have all of that week by week. So they just click on the week they're on and they see everything they need to do. And that, that is so much better than, okay, I go here to see what I need to read. And then I go over here to turn it in and I go over here for policies, right? So that's been, um, that's been a really important takeaway. And, and again, one of those things that we'll take with us, right? Is that that's a really good way to organize the class um, for students. Well, and I think that, you know, I mean, there, as you say, plus and minuses on all of these things. And one of the, the, the things that, um, you know, my colleagues at Raw Holloway have said is that the students don't know how to find anything in the library now because it is all there for them. Um, do you see that as a, a drawback? Um, that it changes their, their research skills? 
I, I don't necessarily. I guess I guess I would say that it depends on what kinds of assignments you're doing. Um, because if you're if you're assigning research papers and you tell them you need to find so many sources that are not on the syllabus that are not things we're reading for this class, um, then they have to do that, right? So, um, I mean, a difficult thing we found is that there's a lot of only hardcover books that are in the library that our students can't get right now. It's been really frustrating, but um, you know, they're certainly getting better at finding eBooks and articles. Um, one of the classes I'm teaching this semester is the senior capstone, the senior thesis class. And so that is a research intensive class. And um, they've been doing a really good job of, um, of finding things in the library. I had a session, which I always do in person too, but I had a session where the library came to class um, and she put together a guide for them. Okay, great. Um, so how has your teaching changed in the online environment? Well, I guess I would say, um, you know, we, so I worked on a group over the summer where we were thinking of principles that we wanted all UC Merced professors to think about with their teaching. Um, and those were things like be flexible with deadlines, um, you know, because of things like, you know, internet speeds and, and you know, we've had lots of students lose people to COVID or, um, you know, have to take over, take on extra jobs, things like that, right? So flexibility, mm -hmm. um, clear and frequent communications, um, showing compassion, um, right? And uh, like all of these things are just best practices, right? And so this is how we sort of snuck in good pedagogy for everyone. It's like, oh, these are best practices for COVID times for online teaching and always yeah. right um so i think that you know being really intentional about those things has been important um and that you know what we really have been thinking about is what do we want them to learn right and it's not so much um about just having this list of things that they need to get through or having this list of assignments but it's at the end of the day at the end of the class what do they know and how or how can they think um, right and so really kind of distilling to those basics is important um, in terms of sort of the smaller things like what are some activities and things that i've learned the thing that's been the um for me the biggest revelation is google docs um okay. right and so for a lot of my classes i'll um I'll, I'll make a google doc that has an assignment for them and sometimes it's you know look at this passage and close read it and follow these questions um sometimes it's when i did the canterbury tales it's like you're you're all going to get a pilgrim and i want you to um write up a new description of them draw a picture of them and say who they would be if they lived in 2020 right um and so they go into their breakout rooms and they all get the link to this google doc um and that's what they work on and it's so great because i'm just sitting there watching this google doc fill with all this brilliant and often hilarious stuff because gen z is hilarious um and it's great and then um i can see when they're done right and then i bring them back together and they share it and then they've got this great resource to study with that they created collaboratively um so i i really love that i think it um in some ways works better than the old kind of group work where you'd put them into rooms and then you know you'd kind of shout over them like how much more time do you need um right that um i think even when i'm in the classroom i might have them still do the google doc um but be sitting next to each other instead of so can all the group sorry all the uh, the breakout groups work on the same google doc simultaneously mm -hmm. yeah i mean i've done it different ways so sometimes i have multiple google docs and sometimes i just have one big one it depends on what the assignment is but yeah it's totally cool well, um, and I, that's one of the things that, you know, I'm getting out of all of this is finding out what other people are learning, because I think, you know, it's been a huge learning curve for everyone. And that was, I think that's another sort of theme that's come out of my, my conversations, is that the students are, are really um, engaging in a, a, a much more sort of, um, they're not sort of sitting back, they're, they're moving forward and, and getting involved in the process, because they know that nobody has the right answer. And I, that's, that's kind of nice to see. It's totally cool. I mean, another thing I really like is in my lectures. So one of my Beowulf to Milton class um, has 91 kids in it this fall, right? And wow. um, they, while I'm lecturing, they're they're chatting away in the side chat, and it's terrific. And obviously, in a in a real lecture hall, if they were going to be doing that, they, that would be really disruptive, right? If they were whispering yeah. something to their peers. But they're able to, you know, and sometimes it's just, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Or, um, you know, if we're talking about sort of, you know, early roots of racism or something, they're just like, this is outrageous. This makes me so mad, you know. Um, or they think of another connection. They're like, oh, this reminds me of John Donne or, you know, 
it's mm-hmm. really it's really cool um and they'll respond to each other and they'll compliment each other right you know they'll be like oh great point um and um and that's, you that's really too. sorry do you respond to their their comments while you're lecturing i would find that oh. a bit um hard to read and and lecture at the same time yeah, i'm getting better at it so 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 sometimes i'll if i see something i'll just say quickly like oh yeah that's a great point savvy like yes um or um you know sometimes when i put them in breakout rooms i catch up on if there's if they're writing a lot and i can't really look at it i catch up on what they've said and then when they come back together i see oh i, I see that you guys were talking about this that's a really good point um right. so yeah, it, it really depends on how chatty they are and kind of how much concentration I need, depending on what I'm saying. But then some often I do open it up. Like I, I say, so what do you think of this? Um, you can either raise your hand or put something in the chat. Um, so, um, and then I'm, you know, poised to, to read and listen. And, and I usually read out what they, what they have said at that point. Well, I think that's the other thing that's coming out of my conversations with people is how much more um, uh, labor intensive it is in a way that you're having to really concentrate and really think you don't just stand up there and deliver. But that, as you're just saying, kind of works with the way that students come into the university. I think that we're, we have been for a long time kind of trying to push them down the chalk and talk road when that's not where they're coming from and it's not what they're accustomed to. Um, so my next question is kind of one that you've sort of answered as well, but I'll ask it again anyway, just because it's, um, is there something unexpected that has come out of this experience? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have answered in, it in that the unexpected thing is that there has been, um, there have been things that I think I will take back to the physical classroom. Um, I guess the other unexpected thing is, and this was, you know, one of the things that we really talked about this um, summer was how do we build community in classrooms? Um, and, you know, can we even do that over Zoom? And that the answer actually has been yes. Um, because in the spring, obviously, I wasn't, it, it, you know, we had, we'd already had a few months together by the time we went into lockdown. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. the students all knew what each other looked like. We had been together, right? Um, I knew them. And so this fall, I, I was worried, you know, what was it going to be like when I had all these students that I'd never met in person before, and some of them hadn't met e- each other. Um, but that actually, we have been able to really connect and bond in, in, in really beautiful ways. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that's important to that is to really kind of open that space for vulnerability, as the Gen Z would say, right, that you, you know, showing your own emotions, showing your own enthusiasm and, and giving them space to do that. Um, that, you know, we had a student read a poem that she had written for her grandmother who died of COVID. Um, I have an Armenian student who talked about what's happening over there to his family. Um, and I just gave him 15 minutes to do that and educate the class on that, right? That like uh-huh. really making that, having them share of themselves in these really personal moments um, has actually really brought us together. And I feel really close to all of these people who I've never met and that's how they feel with each other as well. So that's been, um, I guess, surprising in a really lovely way. Wow. And again, I think that's, you know, something that we don't often make time for, like you say, in the classroom, which uh, is, and being forced to recognize, particularly, you know, I mean, um, even now we're in each other's, you know, personal spaces. And we use, I think there's a sense that when, you know, the students come to the university, we're trying to make, make, make it feel like everybody's on the same page or, you know, on, on an equal playing field, but they're just not. And, you know, this, this whole experience has made that really, really plain. That's right. So I guess, I mean, my the next question is about the outcomes of, um, you know, positive outcomes, but also um, whether or not you're thinking when you, you're talking about going back into the classroom of doing anything in, in um, sort of blended learning. It's a good question. I don't know. Um, I mean, I, as I said, I think that I will, you know, for a long time, I actually didn't even allow laptops in um, in the cl- classroom unless there was a sort of disability need. Um, and and I still might do that a, a lot, you know, that like have moments where it's like, okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna spend time with the text, put your put your tech away. Um, but I do think that the Google Docs and 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 other forms of digital collaboration I might use, um, as well as you know, I, I often do paper workshops and there's no reason that students can't just do that outside of class on their own time. Right. Um, 
you know, through things like Google Doc, and then I can see that they've done it. So um, I think that there's certainly assignments and things like that um, that I will I will take away. And I'll say also, I used to always have my students do in-person recitations, and I hope to do that again. But um, the videos that they've done have been really great, and it's a little less nerve-wracking for them when they know they can do multiple takes. Um, so I can see more use of video and things like that. Um, and I guess I would say that I know now that if I need to travel or something and I don't want to cancel class, it's like, we can do a Zoom class, right? Wow. Um, but I don't necessarily see, and I, I don't know, but I don't necessarily see myself wanting to um, have classes where a lot of the content is, um, is online. And one thing that I, I would say I am not a huge fan of, um, and I was initially, is the asynchronous lecture. Right, um, yeah. Because um, first of all, I think they're totally more work because you get like two sentences in and then you're like, I don't like that. And you start over. And I mean, they just, they're, oh, they're terrible. Um, and also because I think that um, I've noticed that students don't watch them all the way through. Um, yeah. you, can, you yeah. can see that, how, how much they're watching. And I think that they are more engaged in person. So, you know, I do like the filmed Zoom lecture, right? So I, I film, I, I hit record on the Zoom lecture and then if students internet cuts out or they can't be there, then they can watch it later. Right, um, but it's right. first of all, so much more dynamic when I'm interacting with them instead of just like, let me tell you about Shakespeare. Um, so so that's a thing that I think, I mean, I, I know that there's this sort of flipped learning idea of, of posting the lecture and then they watch it and then you come in and do things. Um, I could see that working for things like the sciences. I don't necessarily think that that's a great way forward for literature because it is so the discussion of literature is so discursive. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it sounds. Far. Oh, yeah. sorry. I was just gonna say, oh. well, yeah. One of the things that I think is so interesting is that people are talking about the things that I've been interested in for a long time. One of them being, you know, digital resources and online learning, but the other one being the study of pedagogy and actually talking about pedagogy and making it a part of what we do and not being embarrassed to be excited about teaching. So I think this has really brought people back into being excited about teaching, but you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say the, the one exception that I've liked with the asynchronous lecture is um, because I was in the UK for a lot of this semester, I filmed a lot of things on location. So in Stratford, Avon, in Wales, I did these films, which I'm going to keep. I made, I didn't date them so that I can use them in the future. So that, the, and the students have really liked that, right? Because yeah. most of our students have never been to the UK. Probably most of them never will. Some of them can't travel out of the country. Um, so that's been really cool is that I've been able to say like, this is, you know, Shakespeare's house or this is Wales and um, yeah. give them that, um, that on well, location. Kind and of like you say it, I think, yeah, exactly. The notion of we're bringing stuff back to them, you know, like in our heads, um, it's different to be able to actually bring it back physically. And again, I know people who've been, you know, Zooming with people across, you know, uh, well, not just across states, but across continents and bringing people into your lectures and classroom that they would never get access to normally, but who you talk to all the time. So again, giving them more of your actual experience in the classroom. So I think yeah, that's, that's awesome. a real positive. Yeah, I brought um, Deborah Ann Bird from Harlem Shakespeare Festival into two classes. Um, right. and she performed and talked to students. I brought Randall Martin um, mm -hmm. from Canada in. Yeah. Um, I brought a friend of mine who's a Washington Post writer and um, novelist. I had my students read her book last semester and brought her in. Um, yeah. And yeah, that has been awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I, again, I think, you know, those are things that we could always could have done, but we didn't do. Why didn't we do them? Partly because everybody else was so busy. And now that everybody's stayed, staying still a little bit, we can actually have these kind of interactions. Um, can you think of any, any um, well, is there one or more key drawbacks to this way of working? Is there anything that's really, um, you haven't been able to do? Well, I, I, I mean, I guess I think the key drawback is not being able to see our students. Um, in terms of more kind of nitty gritty, um, I often would stage things with students because I teach, you know, primarily drama. Um, and so there's been times when I have my students read a scene on Zoom, but we haven't been able, you know, when I teach Richard II, I always, you know, have them figure out physically what happens when, when Richard says, here cousin sees the crown. Or when I teach the York crucifixion play, like you really have to get on your feet and stage that to realize like, okay, how does Jesus get on the cross? Does he just lie himself down? What's going on there? Um, so having to just describe that instead of having students do that with their bodies, 
um, you know, that was a big loss. I think that's the biggest thing as a, as a teacher of drama is not being able um, to do, yeah, to do scene work. And I, and, you know, my students aren't theater majors. I don't, I don't do anything low stakes, but I do a lot of open space learning and that's been a big loss. Yeah, sure. So you have said that it, you will take things forward. Can you specify anything in particular about this experience that you will change the way that you teach in the future? Um, I think, well, the things I've already mentioned about, you know, various kinds of technology, um, using those. And, you know, I think that those kinds of principles about the importance of building community, um, being flexible with things like deadlines, being really intentional about um, about learning over grades. Um, you know, those were already things that I was sort of trying to do, but I think that th this experience has, has made it more clear um, how important those things are. Absolutely. So the last question really I have for you is if you have one piece of advice to give to somebody who's just starting out, what would it be? Love them. Oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> Well, again, I think that's what a lot of people have been saying is that, you know, if you don't let the technology stand in the way and you just look, concentrate on the communication, that's the key thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focus on the people behind the screen. Absolutely. And um, any other thoughts or any other anything else you'd like to add? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I've, obviously, I'll think of something after. Of course. But I think that, as you know, as you say, that's the nice thing about these things is that, you know, once you could always add a comment online there, these things aren't set in stone. But thank you so much for um, joining me today. And uh, I hope that your uh, online teaching continues to go well. Thank you. Thank you, Christy.